You are on, Richard. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Richard. I, I know some of you from Crossroads, and I see some uh, new faces here. So it's great to see you. And do come and say hello to me if I'm um, back at church in a week or two. Um, it's great to be here. I'm going to be teaching from uh, John chapter 5. And it's a tremendous chapter. So I want to get straight into it to maximize our time here. So let's, um, I would advise you, if you've got a Bible, I would get your Bible out and turn to John chapter 5. Um, and we're going to be uh, going to a number of passages in the Bible tonight. Uh, so let's do a recap of what Robbie Thomas taught last week, uh, just to set the stage. So we did John chapter 4 last week, and we had the woman at the well uh, who Jesus spoke to in the heat of the day. And if you remember the story where he, he says to her, um, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again, but he who comes to me shall never be thirsty. And Jesus is talking about living water. And I think the woman, first of all, thought he was talking about a spring, because in Israel, living water can be a spring that comes up from the ground. That is called living water. And if you've ever seen a real spring, I have in mountains, and it just comes out of the ground, and it's like this pure water coming out. And the place I saw it, there was like really pretty weeds and flowers growing in amongst this living spring. But Jesus was talking about more than that. He was talking about the eternal water, the water of life. And it's a theme through the whole of the Bible. You get the living water in Ezekiel. Uh, you get it obviously in John chapter 4. We're going to see it again in John chapter 7 uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles, this living water. And if you turn to the back of the book of Revelation uh, later on tonight, you will find living water again. It's a big theme and it's about eternity, living water flowing out of the hearts of believers and going to other people. So this living water, this eternal life will flow out of the heart, the innermost being of people who believe in Jesus. And it will affect those around you. And the living water here is the Holy Spirit. So that's what God is talking about here. That's what Jesus was talking about. Uh, he was offering the woman eternal life more than just physical water. He then, you know, says to her at one point, go call your husband. And this is, is partly to do with authority because Jesus was getting into speaking uh, spiritual truth to this woman. And in the culture, if you were going to speak often to a woman, you would call the husband and you would uh, teach the woman in the presence of the husband. And the Apostle Paul picks up on this in 1 Corinthians 14. He picks up on the headship of, of a wife. If you wanted to know something, you were to go to your husband first. So it is very interesting how uh, the Rabbi Paul, you know, uh, continued this um, this this. Um, teaching of their day that if you wanted to talk to the wife you would call the husband as well so so there's a double meaning there double things going on and right at the end of john chapter 4 we have the healing of um the official son and really that healing is a word of authority because the official comes to jesus and says please heal my son and jesus says your son shall live uh, will live and actually I believe the Greek uh, says there your son lives so it's an actual uh, affirmation it's a word of authority a word of power and that centurion the official sorry the official uh, took Jesus at his word and believed Jesus there's the faith now it's interesting some people who get healed by Jesus don't have faith <laughs> they don't um, the man that was brought to Jesus on the bed we're told his friends had faith um, and tonight if we go to the very beginning of, of John chapter 5 we will see here that I we're not given any indication that this man who was paralyzed had any faith whatsoever and but Jesus had faith and healing for healing to take place all it takes is one person to have faith and you can be healed I was sick many years ago um, and they didn't know what was wrong with me and they were counseling me that they thought it was cancer and I was a young man and I had a friend come and pray for me 
and and this friend said i want to pray for you and i was set to have some ultrasounds the next week to see my my innards uh, to see if there was cancer there they'd done the tests on my blood and everything was pointing towards cancer and my friend said i want to pray for you so you get healed and i literally said in my heart oh lord you've called the b team here in other words uh, i don't i don't think my friend has much uh, powers of healing to help me get well but anyway my friend prayed for me and as he prayed for me i got very hot literally uncomfortably hot where they thought the cancer was in my body lo and behold I went for the ultrasounds the next week and the can the, the, there was no sign of anything. Um, so I think um, all it takes is the faith of one person and, and God heals. So let us look at John chapter 5 verse 1 and let's read through this. Excuse me. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. I'm going to stop there. So there's a feast of the Jews. In the book of John, you're going to have many references to feasts. Um, we're not told what this feast is, but if you just thumb forward to uh, John chapter 6, John chapter 6, verse 4, we read, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So the feasts were very important to uh, the Jewish life. Um, they were the markers through the year. There were three main feasts that all the men of Israel had to go to. Passover, Shavuot and Tabernacles. They were the three main feasts and Jesus who fulfilled the law perfectly would have gone to all these feasts and indeed that's what we see. So back to John chapter 5 verse 1. After this there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate pool in Aramaic called Bethesda which has five roof colonnades. Now Bethesda means house of mercy. Isn't that wonderful? So Jesus is at the house of mercy. Uh, verse 3. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Uh, friends, to me, this is an interesting uh, passage, an interesting question that Jesus is asking someone that's been paralyzed uh, for a long time, uh, do you want to get well? But I've experienced in my life that sometimes when I'm trying to help people who are sick, it's a very valid question. Do you really want to get healed? Because some people really don't. They want, they're, they're happy to stay in their illness uh, because they're comfortable. Um, and he'd been ill for 38 years. So how did Jesus know that he'd been ill for 38 years? We're not told specifically. Maybe Jesus had had uh, like an extra conversation with this man that's not recorded. Or maybe Jesus was using uh, his Holy Spirit uh, gifting, the gift of knowledge here. And he, he, he knew through the Holy Spirit that this man had been there 38 years. 38 years is, is a long time to be paralyzed on a mat. Um, I don't know what the life expectancy of a man in Jesus's day but 38 years is is pretty old um, I would have thought they would have been about 50 or 60 would have been the life expectancy that's just a guess um, but anyway this man had been there a long time so verse 7 the sick man answered him sir I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I am going another steps down before me Jesus said to him get up take up your bed and walk and at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. So here we have a miracle, which is an authority of, it's, it's the stamp of authority of, of the Messiah, the one who was prophesied to come. So in Isaiah 35, um, let's go there. If you can go to Isaiah 35, we will have a very interesting passage, which talks about the Messiah, uh, the prophesied one, and it will actually tell us what the Messiah is, is going to do. And if you remember the story of John the Baptist, when John the Baptist was in jail, he sent people to Jesus to ask him, um, are you the Christ? Are you the one to come? And what did Jesus do? 
what did Jesus do? Jesus pointed John the Baptist back to the word of God. He pointed John the Baptist back to Isaiah. He said, go tell John that the lame are walking, the, the deaf are hearing, uh, the blind are seeing, the deaf, uh, sorry, the mute are talking, and lepers are cleansed, and the dead are raised. And John, and John, the, John the Baptist knew that that was prophesied in Isaiah and therefore he knew that he was the one to come so let's just read I'm going to read Isaiah 35 the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it the majesty of Carmel and Sharon they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. That's what's going on here. We're seeing the glory of Jesus, the glory of our God. Strengthen the weak needs, make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Isn't that a word for today? Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. That's what Jesus does. He comes and saves you and me. Verse 5, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. The waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Well, we've just seen that in John chapter 4 with Jesus' teaching on uh, uh, the, the living water, streams in the desert, streams in the lady who was who had who had, had five husbands a desert place you know rejected at the well in the heat of the day you know all by herself um, so this is the life that Jesus brings verse 7 the burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water in the haunt of jackals where they lie down the grass shall become reeds and rushes uh, and a highway and a, and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. So here we have the, the, the scripture, one of the scriptures that points to our Messiah, that tells us about what Jesus was going to do. He was going to heal people. All right, so back to John chapter 5, verse 5. Now, that day was the Sabbath. So the day that Jesus healed this man was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. So there we have Jesus healing this man, and then he just disappears. He doesn't tell the man who he is. <laughs> he just heals them, and that's like God. God is so kind and so loving and so merciful in the house of mercy that, that Jesus heals this man and doesn't even tell him who he is. That's who God is. And, and we shouldn't be surprised that people around us in our life get healed, and that's just the mercy of God. They might not know it's God, but that's the mercy of God because God is kind. Um, Interesting point here. I was listening to uh, Dr. Michael Brown last week on the radio, and he was a, a, a Jewish man. He was brought up Jewish, and he said that in 1974-75, he was living in New York, and, and he went to the synagogue, and he had a, a cold, a bit like what I've got now. You can probably hear it in my voice. He had a cold, and he had a box of tissues with him, or a roll of tissues, and he was going to synagogue on the Sabbath, and as he got there, uh, you know, thinking he was going to have to blow his nose through the through the, the the service, he was stopped at the door, and they told him in 1975, you can't bring your tissues in here, and he said, why not? And he said, because you're going to have to tear them, and you can't tear a tissue on the Sabbath. Isn't that amazing? So, but the synagogue said, but we have pre-teared tissues in the synagogue, so he had to leave his little roll of tissues outside because he wasn't allowed to tear them because under Jewish law that was work. I mean, it's ridiculous. So um, what happened is the Jewish rulers put all these rules and regulations, the oral law, which kind of built upon what Moses had said and really isn't in the Torah, in the Old Testament, but it's all these regulations, like you can't tear a tissue on the Sabbath. Um, you can't carry your bed on the, on the Sabbath. I think you could carry a bed with someone on it, but you couldn't carry a bed with no one on it. 
I mean, it's, it's silly stuff. Um, but this is what they were pointing out here in this passage. All right, so let's go back. We're at verse uh, 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Oh, my goodness. Think about that, right? You've been ill for 38 years, um, paralyzed, and the man that healed you says to you, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. I mean, what's worse? What, what could be worse than being paralyzed for 38 years? Um, if I could hear a response, I'd love to have one, but, but we can't do that on Zoom. But there are things worse. He could, if he continued sinning, he could find that he's separate from God. That's worse. Uh, that, that could be eternity without the Lord. That's worse than being paralyzed. So um, Jesus is confronting this man, obviously, with sin in his life. Now, the Holy Spirit is very wise, and he doesn't tell us what the sin was. We don't know. We don't know if this man was caught in sexual immorality or whether he had a, whether he had a tongue that just berated people or whether he had an anger problem. We don't know. I think that's the, uh, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. But um, throughout the Bible, um, sin does cause sickness. And that's uncomfortable. I think in our day and age to, to understand that fact is uncomfortable. And the world does not want us to know that. And the world around us hates, doesn't actually like us calling thing, things sin. And, and often people will say, well, what's sin? Well, um, if I lift up my Bible, you can read about sin in the Bible. So if you turn, if you really want to know what sin is or what is sin, Paul, the apostle, said, um, you know, how do I know what sin is? I know what sin is by the law. So if you want to know whether something is sinful or not, you go look at the first five books of the Bible, and that'll give you a very good indication of, of what is sinful. Excuse me. I actually knew of a man who was preaching in Eastern Europe, and he was teaching on, on sexual immorality um, in Eastern Europe, and there was a paralyzed man there uh, through his teaching. And as he taught on, on marriage and on sexual purity, the man who had been brought into this meeting uh, 20, 30 years ago actually started to move his legs. And he hadn't moved his legs for four or five years. And through the teaching of looking back at the law, this man had a measure of healing. Now, we don't know what was going on in that man's life, um, but it's just that there, there, there is a clear link between sin and sickness. But, friends, we have to be careful that we don't think every sickness is as a result of sin. So if you go quickly to John chapter 9, and I want to make this point because it's an important point that um, we don't think that because someone is sick, um, they must have sinned. My mom had cancer when I was uh, about eight, eight years old. And my grand told me that one of the things that really distressed my mom when she had cancer in the 1970s was a number of, of her friends turned away from being friends with her because they said you must have sinned. And so that was very hurtful to my mom. So look at John chapter 9 uh, and it says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So um, here we have the disciples. I think they were like clicking. They were starting to see there's a link between sin and sickness, uh, sin and paralysis. Um, but Jesus teaches yet again the disciples, but it depends, disciples. It depends. Not every disease and sickness is a result of ancestral sin or your own sin. It's just, it's just the way it is. I mean, accidents happen. A tree can fall on someone. It, you know, there's no sin involved. It's just an accident. You, could, you and I could get sick through the environment we live in. That's not necessarily a direct sin. It's just, it's just the way it is. So it's very good that we discern, if we're trying to help someone who's ill, what is the cause of their sickness. It might not be sin. It might just be something completely else. Uh, else. So please don't... All of us, we have to be very careful with this. But 
um, there are passages through the whole of the Old Testament, and I looked up a number, and I don't have time to go into all of them, but let me bring up one uh, or two uh, that, I, that I just looked at over this last day on, on the link between sin and sickness. Um, let us turn to Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. And this is where Miriam um, mumbles against her brother Moses and uh, the Lord judges Miriam because of her sin. And, um, and I'm just pulling it up now. Uh, Numbers chapter 12. And so uh, if we get to uh, verse 11 of Numbers chapter 12, um, so what happens is Miriam mumbles against Moses and and says, you know, um, uh, we can prophesy too. And she talk, talks ill of Moses. And in, and in Numbers chapter 12, verse 11, it says, And Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and, and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when it comes out, when he comes out. Of his mother's womb and Moses cried to the Lord oh God please heal her please but the Lord said to Moses if her father had spit in her face should she not be shamed seven days so Miriam was put outside the camp for seven days as a leper and she became a leper because God judged her because she sinned against Moses okay so that's a pretty pretty nasty example of how sin can lead to uh, to, to illness um, there's another one in the New Testament. Uh, let's just look at that one, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Um, and this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira who were struck down dead by God for lying to the Spirit, uh, lying to the Holy Spirit. So these, this couple sold some property in the book of Acts and they, they brought some of the money to the church, but kept some of it back and lied to the church. And I, I'm guessing they wanted, I'm, I thought about this today, why would they do that? Why would you sell a, like an acre of land here in Raleigh, uh, go to the church and say, here's the money. I think they were trying to elevate themselves in the church. I think possibly they were, you know, trying to look good within the new church. And but they kept some of the money for themselves. Um, but in Acts chapter five, you got this story here. Um, and, the, and in, you know, it says this in verse one. But a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles feet but peter said ananias why has satan filled your heart to lie to the holy spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land while it remained unsold did it not remain uh, your own and after it was sold was it not at your disposal why is it that you have contrived this deed in your hearts you have not lied to man but to god when ananias heard these words he fell down and breathed his last wow I mean, that's a church service, isn't it? I mean, that, that, that would wake up any church. Um, but there is the effect of, of sin and sickness um, in the church in, in Jesus' day, and it's very real. Okay, friends, let us go back to the main passage of tonight, John chapter 5. John chapter 5. So we're at John chapter 5, verse 14. Uh, Jesus found him. Um, and it says, verse 16, and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is always working until now, and I, I am working. Uh, verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So here, here Jesus, because he calls God his father, uh, he, he's elevating himself to be equal with God, and the Jews were starting to, to see him as a threat now. He is starting to say that he is the son of God, and, and that's what they couldn't stand. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath rules, their oral law, uh, he was making himself out to be God. Verse 19, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. 
Um, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has, but has given all judgment to the son. That's interesting that our father God has given judgment uh, to the son so that all will come to worship the son. Uh, Verse 23, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. All right, so there's the gospel. Um, there, there's the message of salvation. Believing in Jesus is eternal life when we believe in jesus who he is the son of god the son of man um, almighty god we pass from death to life this is why this is the born again experience when we confess our sins when we repent of what we've done wrong when we come to jesus we see his holiness his purity and we often see it in in the christians around us we see the love that the christians have and and we're coming to christ and we're believing who he is uh, and Jesus says he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And, and this is the eternal life that Jesus is talking about. That because we know Jesus, he says he does not come to judgment, but has passed from death to life. So it must be that at the judgment, at the final judgment, where we all stand before God, this is where these scriptures come into effect. And Jesus will, will, will claim to the Father, he or she is one of mine, and we pass from judgment into eternal life. Again, Jesus uses this word truly, truly, or, or truth, truth, I say to you. Um, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who here will live for as the father has life in himself so he has granted the son also to have life in himself and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man wow that phrase should have sent shock waves through uh, the pharisees that jesus is declaring that he is the son of man jesus at this point is quoting daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 and 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 at the last two chapters sorry the last two verses here he's quoting as well daniel chapter 12 so let's finish this little bit here he says because he is the son of man do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment so let us turn quickly to daniel 7 and then I've got a short video I want to play for you all. So Daniel chapter 7, if you're able to race there, Daniel chapter 7, we will see where Jesus is quoting from. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions. So this is Daniel having a vision of night. At the night time, a dream or a 3D vision were not told. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which should not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And this is a remarkable prophecy in Daniel. Daniel wrote this uh, three, 300, 400 uh, BC, and he's writing about a man, one like the Son of Man, coming on the clouds, who all the peoples and nations worship. And this is this remarkable uh, uh, hypostatic union, it's called in theological terms, of, of the fully man and fully God, one. And, and this is who Jesus is. And in John chapter 5, this is who Jesus is claiming to be. I am the, the son of man from Daniel. And this infuriated the Pharisees. They, they were, we know, how can you, you being a man, claim to be God? And this is still the issue that a lot, a lot of Jewish people have today, is that God came as a man. Okay, friends, I'm looking at the time and um, we are going to have some time to talk uh, about some of these issues. Um, 
if you want to contact me with any questions you can you have to get my my email get my email from Kristen but I want to play a video for you now um, we tested this out earlier in the week and I think it works it's gonna be about four or five minutes so if it doesn't work for you just hang on and and we'll we'll get into small groups once my videos ended okay so just bear with me I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna see a really good rendition of Jesus um, uh, teaching on this okay so here we go let me get there wow well wow. that that is an amazing i hope you all saw that can anyone give me a nod did you see that oh good good that's that's a tremendous video it's the gospel of john uh it was made in uh, 2002 i think uh, excellent movie um so um you got the discussions questions now. I'm going to hand over to to Kristen. Um, that j just that end of the book of uh, that end of chapter five is remarkable confrontation between Jesus and the and the Pharisees, and 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 this is really the start, almost getting to start of the last year of Jesus's life. Uh, so uh, over to Kristen. I'll hand over to you. <laughs> 